You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coon hounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. In this edition, we're going to take a look at Rule 7, which discusses all things related to timeouts. Yeah, different things that you can call timeout for, and sometimes there's a need for it. Most of the time these days, you don't, uh, we have a lot of hunts, you know, especially hour hunts, 90 minute hunts that might happen for without calling timeout, but sometimes you get in situations where you have to. Uh, so, uh, rule number seven under timeout says judge or majority of cast, if hunting judge is used, may call timeout in accordance with the following. And then there's a note after that that says this dogs declared treed prior to timeout being called shall be scored. That's uh, black and white pretty much. So, I don't think that's true in all registries, but in UKC, that's always been the case. If you have a dog declared treed, uh, you certainly that dog is eligible for scoring and you and you need to score that dog uh, if if called tree before time or before time was called um, so starting with a says this you can call time out when dogs are getting on highway trail onto posted land or trail into a place where there is danger to dogs or hunters uh, sometimes you get that and especially in today's world it seems like dogs tend to hunt out deeper than they used to maybe and sometimes they get where you don't want them to be and uh, you have no choice unfortunately to uh, to uh, call time out and get the dogs now you need to have majority of the cast to to vote that you need want to call time out and uh and if you're, if I'm one of those that has a dog going where I think it's, you know, we have our, we have our uh, telemetry systems. We can see where our dogs are if they're getting close to roads. Sometimes you may think it's not a big deal. This is, this road is no of no concern to you or to, it shouldn't really be. Uh, but maybe it is more to me or another hunter in the cast. You, you know what? We can always just withdraw our dog if that's the case. And that's uh, one of the intents of having the telemetry systems. So we can do that if we need to. But if it's, uh, uh, you know, you have it here in the timeout rules that you that majority can call timeout if need be. And like I said, sometimes that's the case. But I think also when we get into a situation like that, it's also good to be reasonable and uh, just because it's my dog or your dog or what have you or my dog is not involved in it so i'm not going to vote for it uh i think it's a good sportsmanship now the, the rules don't say you have to do that but it's always good sportsmanship to okay if your dog is in in is going to a bad road or something let's do the right thing for you not just because you're uh, that's a bad break for you, but yeah, trail onto posted land or that. And I would always, uh, suggest this if, uh, make sure if, the, if dogs are headed in that direction, uh, it only makes sense to call the timeout so you can have time to get to them before they get there where they shouldn't be. That's the whole idea. Yeah, that's right. And I'm glad you kind of hammered home. I think the biggest misconception here is that uh, people think if they do one of these these things, then it, it's grounds for timeout. But you do have to maj- have majority of the cast if you're using a, a hunting judge in order to do it. So I think you covered that pretty well. That's right. Uh, next one here, Rule 7B tells us you may call timeout with a majority using a hunting judge if dogs get with another group of dogs. So what you're talking about here, it doesn't have to be another cast of dogs, you know, hunting in a similar place, maybe on some – a game land somewhere or something and get with another, but it could be a pleasure hunters group of dogs or something like that as well. So that would be grounds to, to call timeout potentially. Yeah. Moving on to C that's pretty black and white. C is, is as well in case of accident or sickness. Now accident, I think that could apply to both hunter or dog, human or dogs here. Sometimes we've seen it where a dog gets in a tree or something like yep. that, you know, and, and you you want to be careful with that, you know. We talked about climbing trees and things like that, you know. But uh, sometimes you, you you never know what's going to happen out there. So uh, uh, accident uh, and that could include a a, a dog or, or humans or or sickness. And sometimes that happens. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, Rule seven D here tells us that you could potentially call timeout when dogs are trailing out of hearing in different directions. This is probably a rule that gets under you know underutilized a lot of times today. You know we get we have uh, you know we get complaints all the time from clubs and different guides telling us dogs are getting way out of pocket and causing issues and things. Seven D kind of gives the cast the option to 
try to avoid that situation. You know, if maybe the coons aren't stirring good that night and dogs are, are getting out of here in both ways and, and could possibly put the, the cast in, in trouble somehow. Yeah, you make a good point there. It doesn't say, you know, if, if they're just – all going in the same direction you you kind of want to need to tighten up to them if you if you have to you know one way but where you can't judge dogs anymore is when they're going out of hearing in different directions and i think you nailed it i think we sometimes it's one where we don't think about that enough or instead of uh, you know the judges want to be careful that they're not just picking one or the other to kind of go towards and and in doing so they're flat walking out of hearing of another one but it the better thing to do is if you can't judge dogs anymore because of that and it says out of hearing in different directions keyword being different directions uh then uh, hey you have this timeout uh in your pocket timeout option and you should use it only to be fair don't Absolutely. be scoring one dog that's just decide to follow, uh, you know, whatever dog you, you choose to follow. And that's not fair to anybody else. Doesn't anything else doesn't really matter. That's right. All right. Next one. E uh, seven E uh, you can call timeout with a majority of the cast or not hunting judge after scoring dog or dogs on tree and all remaining dogs are either on leash or declared treed. Um, let's, uh, let's, uh, Let's see what that looks like so you have uh after you have you've scored a dog or dogs on a tree so it's after this and everybody else all other remaining dogs are now either on a leash or are declared treed so you just scored a dog or dogs let's say it's two dogs just for a scenario here we've got them on the leash and the other two are also declared treed whether they're together or separate doesn't matter and the cast decides to move we want to move after you know we'd like to get out of where we are we want to move so now what we're going to do uh the cast decides to move to a new location after all trees are scored timeout may be called walking to remaining trees with scored dogs on leash so we've got these two a and b on 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 leash because we just scored their tree we've got c on a tree and dog d on a tree so we can actually call timeout walking to dog c to score it now that's not the case let me finish this and there's a couple other scenarios so we've got two dogs a and b on on leash we've scored them now we can call timeout because c and d are also declared treat we've met the criteria here of this rule we're walking to c we're going to call timeout in the hunt mm -hmm. reason we're doing this is because normally we could have turned a and b loose that's right but not in this case because we're going to call timeout after and move to a different location so we're we're taking a little time away from them but so we're not we're that's why we can call timeout when we get to c we got to call time back in to score and shine the tree you know during shining time we got to call hunt time back in once we've got that done we're going to do the same thing call time out again in the hunt to walk to dog d once we get to d we're going to do the same thing start shine time again and once we've got that scored then we're going to call time out again and then we're going to get the dogs in the vehicles and we're going to move on down the road to the new location now the other scenario is this let's say you have a and b declared treed c is also declared treed in a different spot and d is in a different spot same thing but we're just backing up we haven't we haven't got to a and b yet you can't we can't call timeout walking to a and b yeah. we can only start calling timeout after we have scored a and b That's if right. that makes sense so yeah. so uh there's the first part of of e so let me read that again, and then I'll continue on with it. So it, again, it says this, after scoring dog or dogs on tree, and all remaining dogs are either on leash or declared treed, and cast decides to move to new location after all trees are scored, timeout may be called walking to remaining trees with scored dogs on leash. Hunt time shall be back in during shining time of each tree, which what is what I was talking about. If dog leaves tree, time shall be called back in and dogs on leash recast. So let's uh, re recap this scenario a little bit and change it up slightly. So we have A and B that is declared tree. We take the score of their tree. We take them off and we start heading to C. Before we get to C, C ends up leaving the tree. Okay. Right there, we're just going to stop. C is minus for leaving. D may still be declared treed, and let's just assume it is. But now we have to, we, at this point, uh, we have to now turn dogs uh, A and B back loose again. 
I think you yeah. covered that pretty pretty right. well there. There you go. So yeah, yeah so there's uh, different things in uh, in uh, uh, Rule Seven that we can t- call time out for, you know, and and there's also things you can't call time out for. So uh, you know, make make sure you have a, a a good reason, you know, to uh, to to call time out and a reason that's listed. So I think, yep, that covers Section Seven. I think, hopefully, yeah, I think you got it pretty good there. In this edition, we're going to take a look at Rule 8, which uh, discusses all things related to handlers. Yeah, so starting with A, says this, it is the handler's responsibility to tell judge when dog opens and when dog trees. So uh, that's pretty straightforward. Nobody else is going to do that for the judge. Uh, and, and I think it's also important that handlers uh, make sure they, uh, they do it right. And note the dog that they're calling. Uh, let the dog or the judge know when they're declaring their dog struck and also when it trees. And I know a lot of times if I'm judging those first, that first drop or two, I'm trying to not only listen for my dog, but it's also my job. I'm trying to figure out whose dog is who, Right. you know, so, uh, if you can help the judge a little bit in that regard, you don't also want to just every time my dog opens, that's my dog, that's my dog, that's my dog. That gets annoying too, you know, but, uh. Uh, just to, to help the judge identify dogs sometimes. So, but yeah, handler's responsibility to do that easy, of course. Yep. Uh, next one here, 8B tells us it is the handler's responsibility to check their score and make sure all points are accurate before signing scorecard. We've kind of talked about this a little bit in, in other sections already. If you've been listening to this uh, little series we're doing here on the rule book, and yeah, I don't know. I, I, we talked about it and, and, putting your signature on the scorecard isn't just you saying yeah hey i hunted in this hunt it's you it's you verifying that the scorecard you're looking at is correct now it's you're not saying that everything you agree with all the calls because you may have a question mark on the scorecard or what have you but you're verifying that hey all the scores are correct there's you know all of them have their values on there whether it's plus minus circle delete uh if if there was a question that occurred the questions on there and all that stuff you're just you're just signing that scorecards correct and that's imperative that's that's what we need and that's that's part of the the stop gaps of of making sure that the hunt's successful in the end yep and we hear it sometimes when you want to blame the judge for messing something up that you didn't realize at until it came back to the clubhouse or something you know but uh, uh that may have affected you yeah. you know and uh yeah so make sure you check that and especially if you win the cast make sure you check not just yours but everybody else's too or just make sure it looks right and because it's so much easier to fix something right then and there than it is to try to fix it later when you can't that's right now going on to uh to c and i'm not sure why b seems to be out of order here under handlers you know it's talking about checking scorecards and we go to c where we're talking about earlier on before the, you sign the scorecard but Maybe uh, it seems like maybe next time we get an opportunity need to move that on further down the line somewhere, maybe yep. in the order of things anyways during a hunt, night hunt. So uh, we, so we've covered A and B, and I'll see any handler unable to complete hunt must pick up his dog or judge to give permission for another handler to complete hunt. So you can, in fact, have a backup handler that can, uh, you know, if you get uh, if you get sick or a handler gets sick or isn't able to, uh, you know, gets hurt or lame or whatever, you know, those things happen sometimes. Somebody else can assume the handler role uh, and and carry that on from that point. But when that happens, um, the dog uh, or the you can't switch back to the to handler A again or to the to previous handler. Once you've assumed that role of handling a dog to somebody else it stays like that you can't go back to the previous person anymore then the next sentence says although dog is scratched uh, or withdrawn uh, now that's if you scratch or withdrawn because whatever uh, the handler is encouraged to stay with the cast and retains all voting privileges unless handler is scratched for unsportsmanlike conduct that is one thing that we it's maybe easy for us to to say but i don't really think so because I and you have also been on the other side of it sometimes our dog just is it's just not our night sometimes we're just flat beat and the dog is just off uh and it's just like you know what or whatever that might be the situation that you get into it's just like I'm withdrawing or I am scratched or what have you stay with the cast right rules don't make you stay with the cast but 
it it seems so many times we uh, the whole logic behind if i'm if my dog's done and i have to leave it, it why right if you're winning you have no problem staying you know, but uh, so this rule says the handler is always encouraged to stay with the cast and you retain all voting privileges. Uh, and because I'm telling you, when handlers leave the cast, when it's just down to a couple people, that's when uh, rumors start flying and, and questions start happening. Perception comes in and assumptions come in. And, and not just that, but it also helps the integrity of the hunt. Just stay with them. Stay with them. I couldn't have said it better myself. We we deal with, you know, we've had those conversations with people where you say, man, if you would have, you, you know, you're questioning the score, if you would have stayed 30 more minutes, you know, maybe the score wouldn't, you know, maybe you wouldn't have any question about it at all. And they say, dang it, you're, you're right. I, I, I probably should have stayed, you know, it only yeah. takes one honest person out there. And sometimes, you know, if you, sometimes you have to take that burden upon yourself and be you, that honest person. You, you make a great point. You know, the, you, you, you leave the first hour or whatever, you leave the cast, then afterwards, the next day, you want to say, I don't believe the score they had. Yeah. Well, you should have stayed with them. Yeah. Stay with them. We wouldn't be having this conversation. That's right. Uh, next one here, rule 8D says, if handler leaves cast, they should note hunt time used, note other dog scores, and include their initials in the right margin of the scorecard. Uh, this is one that we've kind of harped on on this podcast before, and it's imperative, and it's under the same circumstances. You know, if say we're at a, a major event, and Saturday morning we have somebody come up to us down there on the arena floor, and they tell us, man, there's no way. When I left the cast, you know, there there was this much time left, and they had this score. There's no way they did that. And then we go and pull a scorecard, and there's nothing filled out in the right-hand column. Maybe there was two people left, and we get a, in touch with the person who was assigned to judge, and they say, no, when he left, there was, you know, an hour 15 left, and we could we did treat three more coons and, and this and that. And, you know, you got this person saying they left with 30 minutes left, this person saying they left with an hour and 15 left. The right-hand column's not filled out. We don't know. We weren't there. It, it makes it tough. That's why that right-hand column is so imperative. Uh, if you're withdrawing or you get scratched from the hunt, make sure you put in that right-hand column what the scores were and how much time was left. If you leave the cast, yeah. And yeah, there you go. If you have to, the least you could do is make sure that's filled out. And that falls, that should fall on the handler's responsibility to do that. And if not, if he doesn't, I will put it on the judge, you know, and judge, make sure the handler does it. That's right. Before they, if they have to leave. Now, if, if they withdraw and don't leave, they don't have to fill that out there, but, uh, they can, it just shows, uh, you know, how much, uh, um, what the scores were at the time when they withdrew, but uh, it really helps in some cases. Next one is E. If only one handler remains, handler must return to the master of hounds or hunt director for a non-hunting judge. Hey, we talk about some rules we don't like that we have. This is, I think, the second one that we've came across here in this little series we're doing that is a pet peeve of mine. I hate that we that we can leave one handler out there and nobody stays with them yeah there are some very unique situations that can happen that uh you know everybody may have to leave but i i hunted a long time and i can't really think of a good scenario that i was ever in that gave anybody a really excuse to leave somebody out there by themselves other than the guy is just a real turd i yeah. said it you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. But um, other than that, stay out there with them, you know, and, and even if it's, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, they have to go back and get a non-hunting judge, and that makes it not only hard for them, but even, okay, you can, maybe you maybe you didn't get along with this. It was a tough guy to hunt with or person to hunt with. Um, you're taking it out on them, but guess what? When they come back in, it also puts a it puts a little thing on the club as well. Yeah. Sometimes officials to get somebody to go back out with them, and oftentimes this is later in the night, mm -hmm. and to send get somebody to go out with them at that point, and somebody else to have to do that, you know. So, um, but sometimes hey, if that's the if that's the situation you are in, and it's a reasonable situation, then th that's what should happen. You have to go back. And number two, if that person has a guide with them or another person, a spectator, or anything like that, or any other person for that matter, 
they can't take it upon themselves to assign them as a non-hunting judge for the person. They have to go back. Yeah. If if I'm the official and they come back and I find out they did that without uh, coming back to assign a non-hunting judge when none of the other cast members, the handlers, the actual handlers all left, uh, I'm not going to accept that scorecard. Yeah. It'll be scratched. Two two things come to my mind just real quick uh, when I when I hear you talking about this rule. Uh, and, and if you're the, you know, second man left and you end up withdrawing or whatever, leaving one guy, don't be the guy who, who leaves at first off, you may be at a major event and the guy has to drive an hour back to the clubhouse to hunt 20 more minutes and he has to get a non hunting judge. And also, like you said, maybe you're only 10 minutes from the clubhouse at the local level and that's your home club and, and you get back there and they need a, a non hunting judge and you know what kind of bind that can put a club into sometimes, like you said, late in the night, that's pretty tough, but yeah, yeah. I think you just, uh, you know, sometimes we, we are maybe disgruntled with we had a bad night, our dog didn't perform, or whatever the situation might be. We're just uh, kind of like, ah, oh, just done. Hey, it happens. It's hunting. You know, it happens. If it won't be your first time, probably won't be your last time, you know. But, hey, uh, you know, wrap it up. as it, it Just do the right thing. Stay with them when you possibly can. Don't leave somebody out there by themselves. Uh you know, put yourself in that position sometimes when you uh, when you need somebody to stay instead of uh, just doing that, you know. But, uh, hey, the other part of that is, too, sometimes you run into somebody who's been totally unreasonable to hunt with and everybody just, you know what, we're not, we're done. We're not yeah. hunting with you. So that's kind of a, it is what it is. Yeah. And the last mm. one here under Rule 8, which uh, has everything to do with handlers here, 8F, it's going to tell us re uh, relaying any type of electronic messaging with reference to scores that is deemed detrimental to the hunt may result in suspension. You know, probably several years ago when you hear this and think of this, you're thinking about text messaging or, or calling or something and saying, hey, the, you know, maybe we're at the second night of the zone. You say, hey, this dog that won their cast last night and they had 750 last night, they, he won his cast and now with 200. So now, you know, 950 double cast win mm -hmm. or something like that. That mm -hmm. would be something I would say is, is deemed detrimental to the hunt. Something that we've seen more recently that uh, is, could sometimes be detrimental to the hunt is somebody may be going – facebook live out there that's mm -hmm. that's electronically messaging to everybody what the person's score is mm -hmm. you know not just yours but the entire cast and, and everything so uh this this uh, rule has kind of got new legs here in the past several years with technological advances yeah you know and it was first put into in into rule to uh when we when scores when there was a lot of placements you know so you know and you know, somebody calling back to the clubhouse or trying to get some, hey, look what the night champions have for a score, you know, and let me know. And, and it, it, you know, it, and it's to help protect the integrity of the hunt, obviously. But, uh, you know, that is deemed, it says uh, uh, electronic messaging with reference to scores that is deemed detrimental to the hunt. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I wish uh, we, that reference to scores would just be state or be out there. And it's just anything that is deemed detrimental because that can encompass quite a few things. Um, but uh, um, that is, at the, at the end of the day, that is still going to be UK's decision if it was reported. You know, any such thing should re be reported. We will investigate. And if we find that it was detrimental, uh, that it, uh, then, then we will not only take the win away or th throw it out or, or what have you, but uh, uh, may also... Uh, take further action and it has happened so but yeah there you go i think we've covered eight you got anything else to add on rule eight under handlers yeah no i think we we covered that pretty good just mm -hmm. a, a lot of good stuff here for people to really take to mind i think in this edition we're going to take a look at rule nine which discusses all things related to judging yeah, and it's basically uh, it, it's a good little section here, and it's uh, officials and clubs should uh, look at that. Like anything in the rules, sometimes it's good just to go back and read them, uh, and uh, it's always good for you and I, I know, to do that, and helps me to to stay up with it. We have a lot of rules that we have to to stay sharp on, but sometimes it's just good to grab the rule book and go go read it. And the other thing with our scorecards that we have today, they're all in the back. The running rules are all in the back, and and to take a look at them. So judges uh, under A, 9A says this, judges are picked by the host clubs because they believe them to be honest and capable of keeping score just as it is given to them by the handlers. 
They will show no favors to any dog or hunter and will inform handlers of score and time recorded, if requested. Uh, authority of the judge begins when he is officially designated and receives the scorecard. The judge shall be in control of the cast. So as soon as they are given the scorecard at the uh, club, they are in charge of the cast, and that's all you know. Part of what the club needs to they are they're expected to, you know, meet with uh, all their cast members, get their guide, and all that. And make sure they know everybody's on the same page. Uh, and if you're at a major event, it's a little easier at the local club level. You know, as far as uh, as far as uh, you know, a time that we're all going to leave, and we're and, you know we're in this truck and this truck, da 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 da, with everybody having a cell phone, it's never a bad idea. You have that note keeping space on your on your uh, a scorecard or anywhere on the scorecard. Write the phone numbers down. You just never know. You might need this everybody's cell phone number at some time, or when you need it, it sure is handy to have. Absolutely. You know, and there's also on their entry slip, it asks for their cell phone or their phone number, and that's why it's good to put that on there. But if it's not, uh, that should be something the judge does. But, yeah, uh, clubs should always be, you know, if they pick the good judges and do that first before you put them on the scorecard, Pick your judges first, and then that you have control of who's judging for you. Now, there might be a little bit different. At some point, we got to get the young guys involved as well. You know, so I think sometimes there's a, you know, uh, when the time is right for somebody, you don't want to intimidate somebody if they're not ready yet. But uh, some of the smaller club type events are great places for uh, the younger guys to start judging. You want them to get their hands dirty. We all were there at one point. Sure. And we all have made mistakes, and uh, uh, but uh, sometimes those mistakes is how you learn not to make them again. And uh, but at the other thing, we have procedures in place for when a wrong call is made. So that should never, you know, don't feel bad if you made a wrong call. Uh, I think in this, uh, we did this little series. Uh, I even stopped you and questioned you on something that hey, that's not that's not right on a timeout thing or what have you. And it turns out I was in fact wrong when you go back and look at it. You know, so any, you know, even uh, sometimes mistakes do get made, but uh, judge selection is huge. You want them to know the rules to begin with, and uh, and and that they are not biased and will do a good job. And if they use guys like that, it sure helps the integrity of the hunt a whole lot. And then it uh, says the authority of the judge begins when he is officially designated the card and gets it at the club. And then from that point, they're in control of the cast that they're assigned to. Mm -hmm. There we go. We can move on now to Rule 9B. That says club will have the option of hunting or non-hunting judges on all casts for each division. A non-hunting judge may be assigned to any cast at the discretion of Master Hounds Hunt Director and or club officials. I think this rule right here, more so than anything, is just giving the the club or the Master Hounds Hunt Director kind of given freedom to s s do what they you know deem necessary. Maybe maybe there's a two dog cast and they have an extra guy sitting around and and, and if somebody would say, hey, you get we got we got two we got two hunters, we don't need to have a non hunting judge. Well, we're just trying to get in in front of any problems or things like that. That might be a, a situation. You use one, or it, it just kind of gives the club and the official the the ability to do so if they need. That's exactly right, you know. And, and we hear that sometimes. Well, they got a, you know, why did they use just one here? That's not fair. They used one here in this category. Well, there's probably a reason that they did. There's no question. There's no need to. You don't. That's that's their business. Why they did. You may as well just leave it at that. But they do have that you know now sometimes we always say when you have problem individuals to come to your club you should let them know if you're going to refuse their entry um you start having people not showing up because of a certain person that's there they just don't flat want to draw them because of right. past experiences with them just uh, somebody it's tough to hunt with uh when it really gets down to it you know what maybe you maybe it's uh it's uh, that maybe this is another option to begin with until until you get the opportunity to, you know, let them know before the event that, hey, we need to take a little time out from our events. But this, they have that. You, you said it good. If they need it, they have that in their back pocket. Yeah, my mind went immediately <clears throat> back to the heyday of the Purina race and whenever guys were in the run and some of those casts could be pretty important. Yeah. And I think back then you, you would assign a non hunting judge to some of those casts just to yeah. keep everything in order. Right. That's where my mind right. kind of went. 
Right. Uh, the next one is a good one. I think we need to, uh, that judges really need to uh, be aware of. Judge must maintain a pace attainable by all members of cast. Very black and white. I think uh, that's one that gets uh, overlooked and not considered sometimes. And that's the judge's responsibility. And I can't help if I have somebody that is a little slower in the cast. Sometimes we just start walking to trees quicker. And there's different things, you know. But that's just all part of it. You know, I think... Uh, I'm already starting to feel it. I'm not 25 years old anymore. I can't walk as fast anymore as I used to, but we're all going to be there someday. And I feel like, uh, you know, we, we, as a handler, I also feel like you need to be reasonable in that you can still participate and you can still get around and everything, although it might be slower. Uh, but then it's also the judge's responsibility to look around, be aware. You know, keep your cast together at all times and um, maintain attain a, a pace that's attainable by everybody on your cast. Yeah, my mind goes to some uh, some calls you get. And those, those are tough calls to take sometimes because someone calls in and says, hey, we got this, maybe an older gentleman who, who enters these hunts. And, man, he's he just can't keep up. And you, you think, okay, I understand your frustration. I guess you're trying to get there. Now with the cast win format, it doesn't matter really how many coons you score or what your score is anymore. You just you, you get a cast win's a cast win. But, you know, I, what I usually try to tell them and what I'm thinking of is, Dang nabbit, that's good. That could be you one day. And they say, well, if I get a, if I get to where I can't keep up, I won't hunt anymore. Well, maybe you won't, but maybe you're retired and you hunt five nights a week and you got a nice two year old dog that you've hunted with five nights that week, all night. And the dog's looking good. And you want to see how it stacks up against somebody. And do you want them to deny your entry or run off and leave you when you're in a hunt? Come on, it, put, put your shoes on the other foot. Sometimes have some respect for, for the people before us. That's right. Exactly right. Uh, next rule here, rule 9D, tells us judge will be the first to arrive at tree. Very straightforward, very simple. Uh, we talked about it. We don't want any handlers getting out in front of you. Keep a pace attainable by all. Keep them behind you. And uh, I think you made a good point yesterday. Uh, you'd be the first to arrive at the tree, but you want the other ones right there with you. So before you get there, make sure everybody's there with you and, and come in together with you in the lead and take charge right there. And it'll make everything way smoother if you have to have to make a, a snap judgment call on dogs that are there or not there or, or potentially a fight or other things yeah and really sometimes i've never really understood why uh you know you have a judge to call in complaining about somebody you know is uh uh you know well he was he was out 50 yards ahead of me and went into the tree before he got there way before me and you know my question is well did you tell him did you well no they're but they're they're not supposed to do that well you're in charge you first thing i'd expect from you is to you know, communicate, let them know, you know, deal with it. You're in charge, be in charge, you know, but, uh, uh, yeah, you know, but then if, the, if they don't, then there's, uh, you know, there, we talked about section six, the, the ugly part of the scorecard and the, the, the section that ends your hunt. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's where you go to usually, or that's where you land those that, uh, don't or disregard, uh, the rules or violate the rules. And that, this is one of them. Uh, next one is E. Even though their dog is withdrawn or scratched, we're talk about, talking about the judge here, they shall continue to judge the cast. If the judge is unable to complete their duties for the duration of the hunt due to other unforeseen circumstances, only then may they assign another qualified handler in the cast to finish judging the cast. I think it's good for us to go back and read what this says, what he, word for word what it says. If the judge is unable to complete, unable, ju that's not just withdrawing or just because your dog is scratched doesn't automatically make you unable. You know, it would need to be a reason uh, that you're unable to complete your duties uh, uh, or any other unfor or due to any other unforeseen circumstances. Only then should you consider to assign another qualified handler in the cast to finish judging the cast. And there's a reason that the club selected you. Uh, you know, uh, take pride in that. And uh, if you accepted it, take pride in it and, and do your, do your job and they will appreciate it. I know we always do. We have a lot of judges to assign at that are some of our bigger events, Autumn Oaks, Winter Classic. And I can tell you, man, it, it's, 
I don't think I really thought about that that much when I was still hunting and if they'd assign you as a judge or whatever, but uh, I think a lot of the a lot of the clubs and they're doing it for the right reasons. There's a reason they're selecting you. Uh, do your job for them. They'll appreciate it, and you're doing a you're doing a big service to the club when you do that and take pride in it. Do it right and uh, stay with it. Bring the card back, your winner, whether it's you or somebody else, and that just makes you a good judge. Yeah, I'm thinking about Autumn Oaks and Winter Classic specifically. Whenever we're doing our or pre-draw and assigning judges to cast. And that's not something we just fumble through there and we're just marking no. random stickies. We take some, we you know, we take some pride in selecting the best judges available to us. And, hey, that takes us a little bit of time to go through all those entry stickies and make sure yeah. that we have, if we have, you know, 60 casts, we pick out the six best judges that we see there that we trust. Yeah. And we if we trust you, we sure appreciate you and, and for doing that. And man, and and one thing, and, I, and it's not part of any part of the rule book. You won't find it in here. Um, but talking about major events like that, and I don't know why my mind went here when we're selecting judges. But if we select a judge, one thing that we're expecting is to get that darn scorecard in, and don't leave uh, one of our master hounds or reps uh, sitting there till four in the morning, and you didn't turn in your scorecard, because that is a quick way to to never get that honor again, and and a quick way to kind of I don't know. It's it's no good to, not, to do otherwise because man, everybody has to have rest. That's a long weekend for everybody, not not just you. Good point, very good point. And that's not just at a major event. That goes for even a club event, you know, because they the official is sitting there waiting for you to come back. You have no choice. Make sure you bring that back. You know, just, don't just go home just because nobody won, and make somebody sit there for a couple hours. That's a good point to bring up. But really, you know, hey. Uh, don't want to take much more time here, but I'm telling you, judges play a key, key role in putting on a good hunt or not. They really do. So we appreciate everybody that steps up, takes that card when they're asked to, and and uh, does the best that they can. And the other thing is, you know what, sometimes you get into situations, positions, uh, scenarios that you don't know what the right call is, and you just flat don't. That is okay. But that's why, don't be wishy-washy, make a call. Make a call and stick with it. You have to sometimes, just not doing anything, don't go pulling the, doing the customer-friendly thing by pulling everybody else, see what they think, what should we do. No, you are in charge. You make the call, and then if I don't agree with it, there's a procedure for me to follow. That is always the better route versus because if you ask everybody usually it's somebody's not going to agree now you're getting in the mud yeah absolutely you know just make a call and even if it's one you're not unsure or that you're unsure of it whether you you're not even sure if it's the right call to make you got to make a call just make it and then uh let the procedures fall in place if somebody doesn't agree with it and then Maybe it's something that uh, one of those that we talked about experience is, is key and you learn from the mistakes you make and maybe after, after all is said and done, you get the opportunity to learn what, it's, what, it's, uh, what the correct way or what if you were in fact wrong and you can correct it for next time. Absolutely. So there you go. Section 9, Judges. Alan, you've been feeding Yukonuba dog feed for a while now. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I have, and I've really been able to put my beagles to the test, uh, mainly running uh, snowshoe hare up north where they run the hardest, where I put 15, 20, 25 miles on them easily in a day. And I've found that the premium performance sport has really paid dividends. Mainly, I noticed their stamina. Yeah, same feed that I've been feeding. I think my dog looks good on it. He's really feeling good and less kennel cleanup for me, so I highly recommend it as well. Yukonubit, the official performance dog nutrition partner of UKC. In this edition, we're going to take a look at Rule 10, and we're going to discuss all things related to spectators. Yeah, we've only got uh, four little bullet points here on spectators, but uh, there we do have some rules. It's good to have spectators. We allow them. 
uh, at most all the events, there's a, there's a couple of events, major events that they don't allow them, but that'll be in uh, ads and things like that information. Uh, but this is, you'll find this under section 10 in your rule book and the running rules, starting with A says, two spectators per handler will be allowed on all casts. And those need to be designated to a handler. If there's any question, they need to be designated. Uh, if a handler has three uh, casts or three uh, spectators, then uh, then he is in violation of this. And the, whoever he's spectating with is going to have his dog scratched. Don't put that person in that position. I think the one that is sometimes tough for us or anybody, but it is a rule violation. And that is often when it's uh, – when it's uh, – a young person or they use a young person and some kind of that people almost feel guilty about uh yeah let's just let that one also not count that one yeah but uh you know there's a reason for uh some of these these numbers you know so don't use that don't put somebody in the position where hey i have you know my three-year-old wants to be along to and da -da 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 -da, you know or what have you if that makes number three, the three-year-old's fine as long as he's not more than two. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. This, it can seem pretty innocent when you just read this sentence here, but mm -hmm. we, I think we've both probably been in situations and we've learned from situations mm -hmm. in the past where, you know, hey, okay, I, my wife and my three-year-old son rode with me out here, so they're not going to do any harm. And you're, and you're thinking, hey, well, this, this that's on like a, a one spectator. But you've got two kids. And you're like, yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, they're young. But then you got the next, hey, he's got his son with him. Why can't I bring mine? And, and his son is 27. And you're thinking, mm -hmm. now we have to draw a line on what ages are acceptable. It's a lot easier if you just stick with it. And sometimes I'll get some calls, you know, you get it at the local level and say, hey, you know, people want to bring a whole truckload with them out there and there's five, six people at the truck, but only two are walking on the woods. The way the rule is interpreted by UKC is two spectators go into the woods with, or going to the hunt mm -hmm. with you basically. So two people ride into the woods with you, two people if in the woods that they want to are staying at the truck. And the reason for this in my mind is quite simple. The judge has a lot on their plate already. They're already policing that they have to judge three or four dogs. They're already having to keep track of the rule book and the scores. They have at least, you know, two or three other handlers to deal with and in the case you got two spectators per handler uh that's enough people you don't need 47 people you need to police out there in the woods well that's correct in the previous rule in section nine we talked about judges you know and we talked about the judges in charge of the cast well guess what he has four handlers up to four handlers and whatever spectators they have he's also responsible for them in the cast yeah you know so and being in charge you know of the situation so yeah you're right in a hurry, you could add up just to having too many. And the other thing is sometimes when you have so many in the woods with you, it's it's just not good. That's more people to consider. It your is pace everything has to be attainable exactly. and everything yeah. else. So yeah. Uh, next one here, Rule Ten B: Spectators may not shine tree unless all handlers and cast agree. This decision shall be made at start of hunt and applies for duration of hunt time. You probably, at this point, if you're listening to this, well, I shouldn't say that. There's a lot of newcomers who could be listening to this, and we sure hope you are. But if you've been to any UKC license event before, you've probably heard Rule 10B mentioned in the Master of Hounds or Hunt Director checklist talking about this as a decision that needs to be made before the cast starts. And even this week, I think you, you might have fielded a phone call where somebody didn't do this, and then there's a question at a tree where a spectator may find a coon or something and say, hey, spectators aren't supposed to shine, and they didn't maybe vote beforehand. But right there it is. We mentioned it in the checklist. It's right here at Rule 10B. It's an easy thing. Just get it out of the way right there at the beginning, and you shouldn't have problems with it for the whole hunt. That's right. You know, you're right. We did just feel a call yesterday about this very thing, you know, and had a little issue at a, at, at a tree with a spectator in uh, later on in the hunt. And that's the question. Did you guys vote on this, whether spectators could shine? Well, no, we didn't. Well, that's why you're in this situation now. Had you done that, we probably wouldn't even be talking about this, but it's all part of it, you know? So, um, and, uh, the key another key thing of the second sentence whatever the decision is and you make this decision before you ever turn dogs loose we talk about judges responsibilities they should make sure that this is the first thing they do before they get the dogs lined up make sure you do that and it takes everybody in the cast all handlers in the cast have to agree to allow them to shine and i think that happens most of the time 
Uh, and you know what? Uh, you shouldn't, if, uh, if a cast member doesn't agree with it or doesn't want that to happen, they probably have their, their reason. Leave it at that. And then, you know, spectators don't, it used to be spectators could never shine before this, you know, but, uh, but then that decision, whatever that decision was at the start of the, that's, that's what applies. But you got to remember, uh, you can't shine trees before the shine time is started. Uh, two things got to happen before you can start shining, and that is the dog has to be handled and start and shine time started before you can start searching a tree. You know, so spectators start. Let's say uh, you're my spectator and you start shining before I've got my dog handled, or the judge instructs us, to, "Hey, we can start searching the tree." You start shining. Guess what? I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be scratched. That would be the result. That would be, it's an infraction, and that would be the result. So if you're a spectator, make sure you're aware of that, and don't start shining until you're, until you're uh, instructed, or until the judge instructs the cast to start shining. That's right. So uh, let me see. Uh, C, next one. Spectators may not be included in the majority required to score trees or enter discussions pertaining to the scoring of dogs. Two things it notes right there. Don't get involved at all. They can't uh, be a part of, let's say you have uh, four handlers, two say this and two say that. And, oh, hey, let's pull this spectator. No, that doesn't work. It's only official handlers only. And then number the last one enter uh, they cannot may not enter discussions pertaining to the scoring of dogs i think that happens too much and sometimes they get away with it but that means may not enter discussions that yeah. means you can't talk about it yeah you th- can't you can't talk about it at all and if you do you're subjecting your handler the handler that you're spectating with to his dog to be scratched yeah, I think it's good. You, you've kind of covered it there in the woods, but also I'm thinking of you bring back a question to be heard by the uh, master hounds or maybe the panel, and I think some of the best officials, what they'll do is just pull the handlers into a meeting and keep the spectators separate because if they're all there trying to chime in, that's going to muddy the waters real quick. So spectators not only, uh, you know, can't enter the discussions in the woods and in the, you know, when they're talking about scoring dogs and, and rule infractions, this and that, but also when you get back to, to get a question heard, yeah. same thing applies. Yeah. And that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean when I was an official, if you were a spectator, I may have made a ruling based, you know, with the handlers doing that and didn't consider any spectators, obviously, but it doesn't mean that I can, Hey, I know this guy pretty well. And I really trust his opinion on it that I might, Hey, what, what did you see out there? But it's just for my own personal, yeah. uh, and, and nothing, nothing more than that. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, when when that happened, I will add this one more thing with respect to even if I am out there spectating, and it's happened to me a lot. I've been out on casts where, you know, as as working at UKC, where I know they have done this wrong and this is absolutely wrong. And sometimes it's one reason that I hate to go. I love to be, go on cast, but the one thing I hate about going on cast is if something is being scored, they want to turn around, hey, Alan, this ain't right. What, yeah. what you, you're here with, say something. I cannot say anything. I am also a spectator. If I'm a spectator, these rules apply to me too. And I cannot enter into any discussions about it, you know, or any, not, not in a, an official capacity or an involved that influences anything, you know? Right. Um, but, uh, and, and neither even, uh, like I said, even if, so if, if you're out there as a spectator and you know, it's being done wrong, uh, let them, you, you don't have a choice. Yep. That's right. Let it be. Yep. You are a mouse. You're a fly on the wall. That's all you are. That's right. You're just spectating. Yep. There you go. Uh, rule 10 D and the last one here in the spectator section tells us spectators are otherwise held to the same rules and conducts of, as handlers. So if your spectator does something in the woods that would get you scratched, uh, that if you did it, you would get scratched. You're held to the same thing. Uh, I'm thinking of a situation. I guess I'll air out a little bit of dirty laundry here, but at RQE, gosh, ten, uh, probably 10 years ago or, or more now, I uh, went to an RQE that night, and I had a guy with me who was just getting into hunting. And that's good. You want to take guys who are, who are new to hunting, and I probably should have coached him up. I told him, to, you know, kind of keep be quiet and be a, be a, like you said, be a fly on the wall. And, my dog slams one first drop first and first uh and we're walking in and we're crossing a little you know we're from east tennessee so we're going down this little dip crossing the creek and got to go up a little rise to the dog's tree and as we're crossing the creek there my spectators 
here he is. I said, hey, put your light down. Be quiet. <laughs> He's used to shining the tree on the <laughs> yeah. way in and things. And yeah. Luckily, nobody else yeah. heard him but me, but there you go. I probably should have been scratched that night, but I got away with it. So there's a little dirty laundry of mine, I guess. But yeah. if if uh, if they would have seen him shining the tree before shine time starts, he's a spectator, but I'm held liable for that, and I would have been scratched from the hunt. I yeah. could have potentially been scratched for the hunt for that. Absolutely. Yep. So. Yeah. Well, there you go. Hey, spectators are also a good thing to have and a and, uh, good thing for, you know, guys to take their boys with them and boys and girls, daughters or their kids and and, and youths and their dads and every you know a lot of a lot of different reasons to take spectators to the woods and good things but you also have to be mindful of a couple of these rules like this so yeah and we've talked about thing. it i talked about a lot if you're a beginner there's probably no better thing than going out and spectating on a couple hunts before you ever get in uh, to the handling business and uh, the rules allow for it in this edition we're going to take a look at rule 12 which discusses all things related to scorecards yeah a couple of good things in here for uh uh, everybody to know and to, to look at sometimes so here we go with a starts with scorecards must be completed in the woods and no changes can be made later except where a question arises and is noted in the woods so a couple things there obviously yeah, finish your scorecard in the woods you don't go do your hunt and go back to the clubhouse and hey who struck first on that second dump you know and things like that no you record everything right away you complete it in the woods including signing it and all this and that and then you don't make any changes to it. And sometimes that happens where you, uh, we, we have a rule that we're going to get on later on in this series that you'll be able to, uh, to hear about if you question something or if there's, you don't agree with something that, that uh, the way it was done, you need to question it right away and da 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 da. So uh, we can't. We've, we've got our cast is done. We're on the way back, and, and I'm thinking, man, we didn't score that one situation correctly. I need to stop everybody, and we need to talk about this. No, yeah. it doesn't work like that. And that they, uh, we've had that where somebody tries to make that happen, and that doesn't work very well. Oftentimes, you know, hey, there's reasons for it, you know, and, and sometimes you don't have everybody, and even if you did, it doesn't even matter. You, you know, you... Uh, you don't make any changes except where a question arises and that was noted in the woods that the official makes a ruling on and then uh, according to you know if they ruled in favor of one way that changes it then they will change it then but there you go with a yeah i have anything to add to that we'll move on now to 12b 12b tells us handler signature verifies hunting time and scores are correct any protest relative to time or scores shall be noted with a question mark yeah, if you've listened to this entire series and all the additions, you've probably heard us harp on this a little bit already. But again, handler signature, you're verifying that everything on that scorecard is correct, um, that the, the correct hunting time was used, that the, all those people's scores are correct, that the correct plus, minus, circle, or deleted is on there, and that if there were any question questions that happened in the woods, that there is a question mark on there, and that's what you're signing for. And those signatures are important to, to validate the scorecard. Yep. I don't have anything to add to that. It's pretty self-explanatory, I think. Um, number uh, or uh, letter C, any handler failing to sign the scorecard in the woods may have the opportunity to sign upon returning the scorecard to and in view of the master hounds or hunt director. Uh, that is one, you know, mentioned in A, scorecards must be completed in the woods. Uh, this is the only thing, you know, if you, if you for, didn't sign it, forgot to sign it, maybe sometimes it happens where a handler was... Uh, maybe had to go get their dog and da 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 or cast had to go get their dog and as soon as they did we've all got our own vehicles and hey i'll meet you back at the club that's not an issue da 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 da, da. and uh, or didn't make it back in time you know to to the at the trucks at the same time or whatever they can still do so uh with the master hounds so here's one of the questions that comes up doesn't talk about here that is how much time do i have to sign it back at the master hounds well i can tell you the master hounds will give you until the return deadline because at the return deadline he's going to wrap things up write up his report and he's going to be done so if you're i would say that should be the time you know how much time they're going to give you to get it signed you know, but beyond beyond that, why well, uh, don't expect the master hounds to sit around until uh, till whenever you know? But that is that you have that opportunity to sign it back there if you are back in time to do so. But you should always just sign it in the woods to begin with. Make sure you do that, and may, and, and I think oftentimes the better thing to do is after your hunt's over, the everything's you got your cast together. You might have dogs scattered out a little bit. 
have the official uh, if that's the case guys got to go round up dogs just get the scorecard all taken care of before you go any further and i think we should say and, and mention uh signing the scorecard that's not just something you do in a non-hunting judge cast you're also in a or sorry, not just in a hunting judge cast, but you should also do it in a non-hunting judge cast if you're at the TOC finals or the world finals or something like that. You're still double checking that the scorecards are correct, and you should sign them, uh, making sure. And, and, and that's you telling telling uh, the official and the club hosting the event that the scorecard is correct. Yeah, there's some registries where you have uh, if you don't sign it or if you sign in the gray or something. UKC doesn't have that because you can sign the scorecard still with the right to protest. Uh, a scoring situation there but yeah so uh, section 12 is a uh, pretty s- simple one of the more simpler sections in the rule book just talks a little bit about the scorecard so i don't have anything more to add i don't think no. alan i know we both have new Daltra pathfinder twos how are you liking yours so far i'm liking it i've even had the opportunity now to use mine where i didn't have service where i download uh, the map of that area and uh, it works flawlessly love it i agree i really like my doctor pathfinder too as well i've used it quite a bit the past few months i really like the crystal clear maps i like that it doesn't lose uh service very much and i can't have i don't have many bad things to say about it at all dogtra pathfinder 2 the official gps collar partner of ukc in this edition we're going to take a look at rule 13 which discusses all things related to ties yeah, and this is talking about ties in the in the cast that you're in or whatever, and all ties are to be broken for placement by comparing scores in the following order. A, number one, is dog that has the least number of minus points is going to be considered first. That breaks your tie, then uh, then your winner is decided. That's If it's still a tie after that, uh, dog that has the most plus tree points, if still a tie, dog has the most plus strike points. If still a tie, dog has the most circled tree points. If still a tie, dog has the most circled strike points. And then the last one, if still a tie, dogs involved will hunt in one hour interval intervals until tie is broken or flip a coin if all parties agree. Now, the rules do not give you any provisions for extending your deadline or anything like that uh, if it came down to that, you know. But, uh, um, you know, this the tiebreakers are all on the back of your scorecard, and it's one where you know, flip the card over and look to make sure you've got them all in the right order. Uh, I was told by, uh, soon after I started at UKC, old Lee Kearns told me one time, he said, do you know you can never uh, break ties uh, by the most uh, strike by strike points. He asked me, why is that even in there? And I did never thought about it. Yeah. Never tried to look at it until after that always stuck with me. And you can't, he's right. You can't break them on strikes. Yeah. It's just the way it works out or whatever. So I'm not sure why that's even in there. And the last one, you know, F, uh, if still a tie dogs involved to hunt in one hour intervals, obviously that doesn't work for some situations. You know, you might have a deadline to be, to be back or, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, just different things, but I really feel like we have, you and I were talking about before we started talking about section 13 here, we have a full elimination rules that have a couple variations of rules or a couple rules that changes under full elimination. And this is one of them. So in that one, we have like a, I think an overtime hunt, or I forget if we call it sudden death or overtime. Um, but that eliminates five F or uh, 13 F where you don't hunt in one hour intervals. But I think that's, that's a better way to break a tie. Yeah. I think I could probably see us updating rule 13 using uh, that across the board because yeah, it's more time efficient and honestly just lead the dogs down and get the tie broken. And it makes a lot of sense. It really. does. It sure does. So, uh, but then, you know, there's uh, some of those others, uh, you know, circle, that's where circle points come in, Yeah, you know, to break ties too. So, and yeah. nobody wants to have to flip a coin in order to determine a winner. But like you said, right. there's Let situations the where, it, you yeah. know, when you, if he absolutely can. Yeah. There's uh, some situations where you have to flip a coin and, you know, we've been, been in that issue before a deadline or a morning is coming and there's some time constraints you may have to, and that's just unfortunate, but that's just the reality of it. Yeah. There's so yeah, there's not a whole lot to be, a whole lot to be, uh, to clarify in real section 13. Really. It's pretty cut and dried black and white, if you will.
Thank you for listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. Be sure to give us a follow so you don't miss any of our new episodes or content.